few quick announcements before we start. Um, one, of course, as always, a huge thanks to the A4 team who always pulls it together. Um, Justine Lee, our programs director, uh, Leo Chang, our operations associate, and Lou, uh, our communications database manager, and Stephanie Shin, our awesome event. Uh, the National Endowment for the Arts, the New York Community Trust, and the Howard 
Gilman Foundation, the Ruth Foundation, and so many generous individuals, many of you sitting right here, um, for making this site possible. So if you want to be among our supporters, if you aren't already, uh, you can text A4 Donate to 202-858-1233 or hit that QR code um, and you can donate via Zelle or PayPal. All right, one, um, one final piece of housekeeping or a land acknowledgement because um, we acknowledge that the land politically designated as New York City to be the homeland of the Lenape and Canarsi peoples who were violently displaced as a result of European settler colonialism over the course of 400 years. Uh, the Lenape and Canarsis are diasporic people who remain closely connected with this land and are its rightful stewards. So as an organization that focuses on the rights of underrepresented people and in solidarity with indigenous people, we recognize this history and we uplift the sovereignty of indigenous people and territory. And we commit to dismantling ongoing settler colonial, colonial practices and their implications in our world. So with that, um, I would like to introduce our first featured presenter, Monica Jehan Bos. Monica is a Bangladeshi American artist and climate activist whose work spans painting, printmaking, film, performance, and public art. Her socially engaged work highlights the intersection of climate, racial, uh, gender, and economic injustice through co-created workshops, art actions, and temporary installations and performances. I will turn it over now to Monica. Thank you to the Asian American Arts Alliance for inviting me here. Um, I haven't been in New York in two years, and I only came because you all invited me. So um, awesome, and I really um, don't know that. I have been following a little bit, but it's um, really exciting to be here. And some of my friends from Saucy are here. Yeah, and some of my friends from DC are here, too. So um, thank you. So um, I think we're starting with a slide. Um, so. I, so this first image is from a performance. Um, it's a brown woman in a wet red sari climbing a white uh, marble European sculpture. Um, there's people around uh, holding worn saris from Bangladesh. It's raining. I'm trying to create decolonized narratives um, using the sari. Uh, I'm going to show a couple of quick videos, and I'll talk a little bit about my work. And then so just you take it away. Thank you so much, Justine. Of course.
this transcendent part for me. Climate, 
and I ended up in the rising seas, and I ended up in the water in the format that's called Unwrap. And then Unwrap was pre presented, a version of it was presented at the Brooklyn Museum also, right? As, as part of Salty's Women's Story Sanks. Um, and then the salaries, um, some of it sort of kept more pristine and not worn, and I've been used in various installations in Bangladesh. The first exhibitions I did were called Layer by Layer, thinking about the layers of the sari, the layers of the onion, the layers of the meaning, and I used actually um, the voices of the women, their actual stories, their actual own voices, and then their journals, um, saris, and multi-layered, and the saris were, the video was projected through the sari in multiple layers. Next. And then that same sari that was in Dumbo and in Washington went to Miami for this performance called Double Bayou, which means kind of Bangla. And this physically, literally, uh, we actually went to the water connecting with the women from island to island. My name beat to the barrier island, much like the island my family is from. And it was uh, supposed to be connecting women in solidarity um, across from ocean to ocean. Uh, and I ended up in the ocean at the end of it, thrashing the waves with a red sari. Next. And then that same sari was actually displayed very simply uh, in an in installation in the National National Museum, including the video from the Dumbo performance within that um, uh, installation, of, as well as uh, the video of uh, the women in Bangladesh. Um, next. And then I've also gone back to painting. I've been painting uh, these kind of fun paintings, I think, about joy and women working together, inspired by these performances that I've been in with a lot of women. This is based on performances in Miami where uh, we, made, we made a raft of coconuts and bailed water um, to stop to otherwise next. And then um, another painting based on a performance in Washington next. So I've done a lot of things on, and then I've, I've done installations and performances. It sort of kept going this project in different places, by the sand, and in Greece I made a house in sorry to speak about climate migration, and people actually slept inside at times, people took naps. Going. Um, and then um, the right, the one on the right is at the Macro Museum in Italy, where I created a climate lab on top of um, the museum, where people could come and record their stories of climate displacement, of climate anxiety. Next, and this is um, then I got into public art. This is one of my first big public art projects in Washington called Rapture, where uh, I think you saw the video from uh, from it, part part of it. Um, so all these people worked on making stories together. So Five stories were co created with people in Bangladesh and DC, and we wrapped five historic buildings with them. Next. And I've done other, this was last year. Um, this is actually Jumi, Ko, Jumi who's here with a part of this project it's called Sustain. We planted, we made a garden, we wrote poetry about food and climate justice, and then um, we wrapped the stories vertically um, up like this with the poetry in Bengali and English. And there was also an installation across the street. And I uh, did a performance um, in Bangladesh this year. I've been doing a lot of performance lately. Uh, this is called Water Woman Jalpana, about sort of the burden women face in climate change and in gathering water. We gathered water and water plants for three hours all around the city in the streets. Next, I work with the Bangladesh woman. And so this one links to fashion more. This is a performance I did very recently at the University of Victoria for the Gender Threads of Globalization Conference, which is all about the gender labor in the fashion industry and then also in, in textiles, even in Asian times. And so I created a performance using sewing machines, um, speaking to women's labor, and then we, uh, I think there's another slide, um, just see the next one, and then people at the conference uh, from all around the country and the world, like they joined me, also with a lot of women, and some men. We uh, repaired a lot of my rich stories from prior performances, and so the sewing um, performance, where we learned about slow fashion, right, by learning to repair your clothes. up right now in Washington, it's called Nourish, and it actually has, Jimmy, one of your poems is in that um, uh, exhibition. I'm actually making katas, so I just want to show you, I'm working on a series of katas inspired by my grandmother. Um, they're actually recycling the old, the sorry that the women have worn in Bangladesh from this project. It's been going for 10 years, this project, so I'm sorry, so the sorry that worn out. They wear out for about six months, but they wear them every other day. And so we've been using the old saris, layering them, and working on embroidery, and I have my own embroidery and more with luck at the end. So far, I've only finished three, but I'm hoping to finish some more at some point. So that's, I think that's the end of my slides. Um, one more is have my contacts. Okay, and now I'm going to do a little tiny performance for you. So I make people, I make people um, write poems. Um, for the last couple of years, a lot of poems in my workshops. So I have a one that's called. Uh, on to the title band. As a child, I 
faded my grandmother's rice fields, tasting the new tan straight from the keg, along with the sweet chili sugarcane, arcade wash dripping down my chin. Gripping a floating banana tree, I learned to swim in my nani's pond, bobbing up and down in the green water filled with fish, big and small. I called my nani Nanu, my ma's mom. Nanu would be surprised to see that I'm back on her land, the tidal land by the Darjira River, eating of the katla fish from her pond, meeting the village women to learn how their farming is going, how they rebuilt after the last storm and knocked down trees, the last storm that knocked down trees and killed their cows, goats, chickens, and ducks. We work together on our saris, write in our journals, sing and dance, and record our words and songs. How many saris have we printed? How many hands have touched and written on the saris? We have worn them, danced in them, carried them to the water while barefoot. They have traveled on boats, planes, and buses, and they come back again to cut the coffee by the Darjira River and the Bay of Bengal. The tide comes in, Joarayo. The tide goes out, Pakayareta. Is it because my horoscope is cancer that the tide pulls me? Is it in my DNA from my tidal ancestors, rice farmers on the Bay of Bengal? Am I also a girl from the tidal village? Now, the rice struggles to grow in the salty soil, salty from the rising sea, from endless storms and cyclones. The dhan rots from surprise rains in December during the dry season. Winter has never seen such rains. Winter is the season for harvest and making sweet jalapitas with the freshly husked rice and coconut, which once grew abundant in the sandy soil. Thank you so much. 
Um, Monica, let's give another hand. <laughs> She is presenting via video. She's on our Artist Council, and she can't be here tonight because she's in Thailand, which she will tell you. Um, but the next, uh, the next picture will be uh, Chupang Fang, Ben uh, Yang Yang Fang, George Bridges, Ray Xiao, and Juto Rao. So, um, Chupang, you should be ready to go right after this. Hi everyone, I'm Amanda Pumpudibakia, and I have the great honor of being part of A4's Artist Council. I wish I could be with you tonight, but I'm currently here in Bangkok in my studio working on my latest public artwork, Time Owes Us Remembrance, celebrating generations of Thai and American textile communities. I've spent months having in-depth conversations with dozens of mei yai, aunties and grandmas, across Thailand and textile artists in the United States, immersing in their intricate craft and ancestral wisdom. This work is part of a larger project called Weaving Our Stories, which celebrates 190 years of diplomatic relations between the United States and Thailand. But to me, this work is so much more personal. May Yai embody a kind of incandescent cultural knowledge sharing and community building that I feel so grateful to witness and participate in. They showed me which trees, mud, and fruit peels give the right hue and texture to the fibers, how to work their looms, how to cultivate silkworms, and dye with indigo. The sadness in their eyes is palpable as these traditions are being lost by every passing generation. And I hear the same thing when I leave a community. Don't forget me. Don't forget us. As a Thai American artist, I feel responsible to fight erasure by bearing witness to living heritage. I'm sculpting and weaving together dozens of lovingly crafted fiber pieces into an interwoven multicultural textile sculpture that will be unveiled next year at the Bangkok Art and Culture Center. Like the pattern shaped by native flora and fauna, this textile work tells us who we are. It insists we honor those on whose shoulders we stand. And in uplifting untold beauty and struggle, this work proclaims that the invisible deserves to be woven into our collective memory. Time owes us remembrance is for the forgotten and the unseen, because when we know our history, we can shape a just future filled with compassion and joy. Thanks so much. I guess the attention span that we can have 
for any certain given thing in life that's beautiful and requires time and effort to really let it grow with you. I have five seconds. I'm just going to do a my room. George's Bridges, and I'm from the Asian American Film Lab. Uh, we promote ethnic and gender diversity in the film industry, and I wanted to talk about some of our projects. During the summer months, one of our projects is the 72-hour shootout, which we just recently finished. And during the fall months, we had the unfinished work uh, project. Our first project is Thursday, October 19th at 21 Pell Street. Uh, Fashion incorporates into our, into our work because, as I mentioned, we promote ethnic and gender diversity in the film industry, and that includes uh, promoting uh, projects that have to do with fashion, um, clothing, uh, whether you're a designer, or a filmmaker, um, a screenwriter, we'd love to hear from you. Our website is asianamericanfilmlab.org. You can send us a message, email us at info at film-lab.org. Thank you very much. project that I need to help to execute. Um, over the last two years, I worked on a body of work consisting of large oil paintings on canvas um, about my experiences in Istanbul, Turkey when I was living with my single mom who went bankrupt 10 years ago and started fostering 15 street cats in our three-bedroom apartment. It was quite the experience. Cats and the fleas that infested our apartment revealed so much about our household, generational traumas, my identity crisis as a Chinese Turkish individual, and hierarchy in our household, and so on. In 2019, I came to the US to study fine arts on Fulbright scholarship, which is how I afforded leaving my country behind. I graduated this May and moved to New York. My student visa ends in July 2024, and within this time period, I want to work on getting an artist's visa. 
For that, I would need to have a solo exhibition, and having it in New York would tremendously support my case when I apply for the visa. It's imperative that I apply for the visa when I'm still in the U.S. because Turkey is in a severe economic political crisis and visa applications are constantly rejected, especially for artists who are accepted to programs here. Some of my paintings are in Turkey because I would go back to Istanbul for summer breaks in college and paint there. This whole body of work is really precious to me and I need the support of a gallery that can help cover the shipping costs of the paintings that are not here with me in the U.S. If you know anyone who might be interested in helping me bring this project to life, please let me know. Um, the last, last slide should be um, the, the tattoo that I've been doing since I moved to New York, which is how I support myself right now. And I bought a lot of business cards if you're interested. Thank you. working particularly in India, 
uh, because as you've seen in so many of the presentations tonight, there's just an incredible um, tradition with textiles, and it's not just about it being a material, but it's deeply intertwined with heritage, it's deeply intertwined with truly sustainable techniques that are connected to um, a lot of traditional farming practices, and the motifs and the heritage are often uh, rooted in a lot of um, sacred origins as well. But one thing that you see often and you hear over and over is uh, my culture, I don't know how, uh, who's going to pass this on or how this is going to contain onward. And so when I really looked at it, it's like, okay, we have anthropology as a form of conservation. Um, and there was a, a community I was working with in, um, in West Bengal, and it was a puppet theater in a tradition where no one's really documented any of this work. Uh, people, the, the only documentation I found was a PhD scholar who spent five years documenting the work. And ultimately, I was like, well, for the younger generation, when I asked uh, people in my community, like, why wouldn't you want to continue on this work? They said, well, it's, it's, it's my heritage, but I need to make an income. And I also uh, want people to, like, I want to do something that's cool. And that really struck me, the word cool, right? Like, cool is such a weird, arbitrary notion, but it is a notion that does drive cultural currency. It is, it has become the pulse of how we think about ourselves in terms of identity and perception. And so how does coolness get decided? And so that kind of took me into the journey of fashion, which I think is now a good second part into what this video was like. Yeah, unfortunately, the sound is going to come from your computer, so everyone just stays quiet. Okay, cool. No worries. Yeah. yeah. There are millions of indigenous artists around the world. Together, they would form the fourth largest economy. Cultural appropriation creates a big loss of opportunity for a lot of these artists. My name is Rebecca Hoy. I'm the founder and CEO of Room Studio. Room Studio is a collective of indigenous artists and creators, and we digitize and license artwork to fashion. So there are millions of indigenous artists around the world, but large artists are receiving less than 2% of the profit. At the same time, you have a $2.4 trillion fashion industry that is constantly looking for inspiration for ethnic designs. We train the artists to digitize the design. It then gets coded and uploaded into our online library that then allows grants from around the world to be able to Browse and then select mine. We've worked across 2,500 artists in India. We also have pilots in Panama and We're really excited to be part of the party. We can go next from here. Um, um, and yeah, so this is an image from nine years ago. Um, back then, I was doing a lot of work as an anthropologist and researcher in Asia, mostly in India. And when I was spending time um, studying how indigenous and rural communities coexist with uh, wildlife and, and nature, I realized it's not just um, the traditional knowledge, it's also uh, material is completely intertwined with um, with stories and the pieces of cloth and the indigo are all connected to the indigo that they have found in the rhythms of the land. Uh, next. And so to me, this was always something that struck me because uh, in, it, there was a feeling in my heart like time froze. This was in some ways the treasure of the earth, uh, but it was the same narrative that everything was going away. Next. Um, so I, I started to think about like, how do I, um, how do I bridge all these worlds together, right? Like, uh, I have my foot in multiple doors, but I kept hearing the same narrative of it isn't making money. So I left behind this really uh, derpy photo of me because I think behind every journey, it's really like this is truly how it feels. Um, <laughs> uh, this is in 2015 in uh, the state of Nagaland in Northeast India. At that time, I was uh, living in this village. Uh, I had like, Say I had like lived on $5,000 that year, and I was like, okay, we're gonna 
figure out how to bridge these cultures because uh, there, I want some audience to really value just how incredible, beautiful this is, and how do we do that, right? Like, how do you convince that value? And that kind of started me on this journey of a world I had run away from for a long time, which is the world of capitalism and money. I was like, I want to get away from it, like the structures around it are, there's so many things that are um, exploitative, right? But if you're hearing the same narrative that from um, the younger generation, we have to make money, like how do we bridge all these worlds together? Next. So I started on this journey of thinking through, well, I have my foot in multiple worlds. Um, my foot is constantly bare. I just leave my shoes off all the time. Um, and so how do we, how do we um, contextualize all these amazing works and stories um, to this global zeitgeist? How do we translate that? Next. Um, so the first project we did, one of the communities I've been living with um, was this puppet theater village that was making these amazing backdrop, um, backdrops for a village theater, but then it became obsolete because television came around. So I was like, let's take the same artistic tradition and put it on something practical that people could buy. Um, and we can co-collaborate with artists to do this. And the only product I really knew how to make at that time that I could maybe obsess about thinking of making was sketchbooks. Um, so we ran this Indiegogo, and then uh, we needed fifteen thousand dollars to run a first batch, which we got. Next, and then we got all those delivered. Next, and then we started selling uh, sketchbooks. <laughs> Uh, and then these uh, uh, notebooks uh, ge generated over $40,000 in value for the artists and communities. And it just was a format to tell the story of this art form. Um, and then at this time, people were starting to buy more notebooks from us, but I was like, I don't know if I can do this, uh, to necessarily start a, a notebook or sketchbook company. It was still this idea that really captured my heart around how can we reimagine um, cultural artwork to be reformatted into um, into equitable formats. Uh, so it was really interesting at this time, a lot of designers started to see our work and was like, I don't buy paper, but I think this artwork would be really cool on like wallpaper or something else. Next. Um, so it started to bring us down this idea of like, how can we bridge this onto new formats and co-create and put the language uh, on both sides for, for designers and communities. So this is an art form from um, Maharashtra, it's from the Worley community, next. Um, they had started digitizing their artwork and then with their consent, we licensed it to a Pacific Northwest brand called Alpha Research, next. And the royalties from that first collection, which was the first textile printeries, was one of the largest injections of capital that didn't just go back to one artist, but to the entire community, next. To the point where it also worked so well for the brand, they ran three years of collections with that community. Next. Um, yeah, you can hit play on that. Um, and then beyond that, right, like it wasn't also just about it ending up on clothing. It was also thinking about how can the motifs in the artwork um, be contextualized on other formats. Like uh, the artists were always saying, hey, I don't want it to just like end up on a puffer jacket. And I was like, yeah, I agree, right? It doesn't. It doesn't do the full justice of what the storytelling can be. So we worked with 15 of the artists in that community to create um, these animations that have been now uh, uh, been, there's been a lot of interest also from different media groups to be able to see how can we tell the stories of these art forms that were traditionally done on house walls. Next. Um, and so some of you will probably recognize this region, but this is uh, in the Sundarbans region between Bangladesh and India. Next. And so this is a region that I spent um, more than a year working in. Uh, next. And oh yeah, you can hit that, it's a video. And there's an art form where they make these amazing scroll paintings called Patajitra, and the scroll paintings are made out of uh, natural colors. Next. Like turmeric, and then even um, when they call uh, orange, it's the, uh, it's the Bengali name around marigold, um, because it's straight from the Maribyrds. Next. And so there was one scroll painting that was particularly interesting. Um, it's all these animals having a meeting in the uh, center bonds, and they find out that uh, the lions and tigers have been eating the other animals. So the elephant chimes in and says, why are you, um, why are, we shouldn't eat each other, we el eat alternatives. And in order for us to get along, we all need to eat alternatives. Next. 
And then this is the artist narrating it in Bengali. Next. Um, and so this is actually a print that um, Patagonia licensed. It was our first uh, design collaboration. It took us four years <laughs> to build this project. Uh, next. And they thought the story and the essence behind it was uh, so meaningful in terms of having an alignment with their 50th year anniversary, which is coexistence, and how do we share this whole planet together. Next. Oh, yeah. And so, next few slides, we can just go through them quickly. They're all examples of different collaborations that we've done. Next. Next. <laughs> I'm going to go through these because there's just a lot of slides. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and then so this is a really good example of an end to end collaboration. Oh, yeah, we can go back to that one. Uh, there you go. Yeah. The, yeah, that video. <laughs> no worries. It's cool. We don't have to. Um, there's, so, there's so many graphics for me. Yeah. So, this is a collaboration we did with one of the communities, also in Madhya Pradesh, where a um, a Spain-based brand uh, worked with this community to create a collection, but then they really went and wanted to understand the culture and the communities fully, so five of their teammates traveled with our team to uh, interior Chetiscar and uh, wanted to bring out more of the depth of the story behind the collection. sort of at risk of being lost. Um, they're often farmers who have art forms that are intimately connected also with the land. And then creating an ecosystem where um, instead of it being, hey, a designer from Iran, not knowing, like seeing a really cool art form and saying, oh, I want to make it in the style of this, they can actually work directly with the communities. Next. Um, and yeah, that's, that kind of explains what we do. Next. And so this year, uh, we were really excited because Beyond working with brands, we were like, what if we um, brought and brought uh, the community's works closer and more quickly directly to um, people around the world, and also show um, so many of the truly sustainable techniques that you can't otherwise do through all of these large-scale um, um, partners. So we partnered with um, Karen Wong and Derek Wiggins, and we said, hey, like, and and. One particular field that I was really interested in is streetwear because if kind of going back to what the artist said to me about I just want my culture to be cool and relevant, I was like, well, streetwear is a really interesting direction because it started from it's just DIY, it's just people creating things and then and then putting things together. And so, what if we put a uh, rural with the urban together? And so next we formed. Ruben <laughs> by Ruben Studio. So we launched a streetwear brand um, starting in June of this year. Uh, next. And our first drop was in June, which we highlighted the works of three communities, the Beals, the Gons, and the Warley communities in uh, Central India. Next. Uh, yeah, you can play this video. Um, this is a little bit of a snip, uh, snippet of the event that we threw in Brooklyn. Um, I have some of the pieces with me. Um, and yeah, the whole idea, and it was really funny, we created these pieces, we brought them back to the artist, they were like, why is everything so oversized? And I was like, it's streetwear, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, anyways, uh, next. So uh, this first piece, there's a video on the right that shows the artist at work. Uh, this is from an artist, his name is Koldi Kusharam from the Gon tribe, and he's painting this artwork where a lot of the art forms show um, uh, this really uh, interconnected, like a lot of the animals and the trees and the forms are 
are very much um, rooted around this idea of the tree of life. And here is a hoodie with natural dip dye bases, and we're in our root studio. And if you're interested, we do have some stock with us. Well, I have one here with me today. <laughs> um, next. And uh, this is also from the same artist, Cody. And you know, in his um, village, he's a tractor driver, but he paints like this. And when I saw his work, I was like, wow, you should call yourself an artist. <laughs> um, so we put his work on this hoodie, trying to really reimagine the way that streetwear can be um, art. So there's 20 pieces each. We're probably like down to our last five in case anyone's interested. All the proceeds will go back to the artist. That's this one is from an artist in the Ville Tribe called Subash on New York. I love it. There's just, when I saw these, his massive canvas of cats, we were like, we gotta make a cat crew neck and just have cats everywhere. Uh, next. And so I'm probably over time, but I'll just like <laughs> wrap up in a minute. Um, our, our second collection is. Um, bok joy, which is part of the stuff that I'm wearing here. And we, uh, from the first drop, we got a few partners in the streetwear scene, including a streetwear brand called Noah, um, 3.1 in the of Limb, and Triple Five Soul. And we decided, let's really bring the rural to the urban, the urban. So they gave us all these pieces, and we took it to three villages that we've been working with in the last six years. Oh yeah. And uh, we were like, why don't you design it? Why don't you use your own techniques, your, your dyes, and, and show the urban how it's done? Uh, and yeah, and so they applied their own techniques, applied their own um, uh, cotton that they grew, um, their own indigo, and that's me being super overly sweaty <laughs> on the ground. Uh, and also just showcasing everything that um, we've been creating back and forth. So, yeah, um, we just got our dates for our second drop, which will happen in October. But, uh, yeah, follow us if you want to keep up with our drop too. And thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much. Do you have any patches with you? I have like a great patch that I got at the. I see. Yeah, they're beautiful. Um, <laughs> Hucka thinks it's a treat for her, it's not. Okay, uh, okay so for our next um, group of two minute pitches, um, everybody, your names are up here in the order in which you will pitch. We're gonna start with uh, Sian Wong, then Kim, Westfall, Sally Kong, Tomo Mori, Ami Park, Shannon Yu, our 2023 Jane Wong Fellow, and then Lulu Min. So uh, Sian, you wanna kick us off? Thank you, it's really hard to follow up to what Rebecca just said. Um, um, thank you, thank you A4 for having me and thank you for having a space for artists, uh, Asian Americans in particular, and I'm so glad to be here. Um, it's always a pleasure, I'm always learning so much. Uh, so today I'm here to share with you um, my upcoming exhibition, I Paint, and yes, uh, Lives of Three Canners. Um, I want to share, I've been painting for a little bit, and uh, this exhibition is uh, uh, going to be from October 29th to November 17th. I'll be sharing their stories and the goal is to have a conversation. Um, I, I think Rebecca's presentation is so amazing because she's actually showing solutions. Um, I'm just pointing out an issue, um, and I'm sure with all the creative minds out there, we'll try to begin to find a solution to issues that we see. And um, I am partnering with uh, Picture the Homeless Oral History Project. Um, they have a canners campaign. They'll be giving a workshop about the history of the bottle bill uh, and uh, basically how canning works in New York City for the past 40, 45 years uh, and you know, sharing stories. So the founder of the canners campaign, uh, Gene Weiss, 
um, is actually a canon himself. So that should be interesting. Follow me on uh, Instagram, Facebook. Uh, that workshop is going to be no Saturday, November 4th. It would be great to have you and if you invite your family, invite your friends. So this is a, um, a well, I'm also currently having uh, an exhibition on Governor's Island. This is actually, um, well, this is undaunted that that's the Governor Island exhibition. <laughs> um, and that's ongoing until the end of um, October. So you're welcome. Please come. Oops. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Two minutes goes really fast. Thank you. Thank you to the Asian American oh, sorry. Thank you to the Asian American Art Alliance for inviting me to pitch tonight. My name is Kim Westfall, and I make tufted ribbon tapestries, exploring the historical conditions of the alliance between the United States and Korea. I'm here to talk to you about my favorite place in Korea, a place I just traveled to a couple weeks ago. You can advance the slides. Um, a place I traveled to a couple weeks ago. A, here's my word. Okay. That place is called the DMZ. The DMZ is 160 miles long and 2.5 miles wide, running between the Democratic People's Republic of Korea in the north and the Republic of Korea in the south. The zone was established between the United States UN Command and the Soviet Union in 1953. Slide, please. But that's in the past. I'm looking for like-minded DMZ enthusiasts who are interested in bringing about a beautiful future to heal the land from its war-torn past. Slide, please. I'm looking for early investors and disruptors, slide please, to join us in cultivating the DMZ, slide please, as a special economic development zone. A robust tourist industry already exists in Paju with DMZ souvenirs on the next slide, amusement park rides, you can keep going, um, and festivals. This transformation from the demilitarized zone to special economic zone will awaken this land teeming with flora and fauna as an enclave of free politics, real estate development, and experimental business practices. You can keep going and showing the animals, they're cute. That will charter a new future for Koreans on both sides of the DMZ and their American allies. I recently participated in an exhibition called DMZ Checkpoint where I installed my record player installation, Spicy Memory, and 2015 piece, My Eyes Are Down Here, in a historical recreation of a U.S. soldier's barracks in a Quonset hut. The transparent record made of resin, gochugaru, my shredded adoption documents, and ribbons spins without stylus contact, as the Vera Lynn's We'll Meet Again plays from an unknown source. I also showed work from my DMZ Orchid series, Indoor Observatory, that serves as a viewpoint to look into North Korea. Please find me afterwards if you're interested in discussing the DMZ or have questions about the art exhibition. Thank you, and thank you for letting me go over time. Hello, okay. Hi everyone, um, my name is Sally, and I'd like to introduce you my project, My Toes. Um, it's a work in progress, but I wanted to take you through the background work and motivation behind it, starting with this image. So, these are stained chick cells. So, something that you might notice here is the nucleus. Next slide, please. Um, like with the little dots, and as we know, that's where most of our DNA lives. But did you know that somewhere in the cytoplasm, in the mitochondria, there is more DNA that's and these are the mitochondrial DNA um, that you often find in these ring forms. And that sequence to the right is actually the sequence of my mitochondrial DNA. Um, and then next slide, please. And this is a weaving pattern that I drafted, um, generated using this mitochondrial DNA sequence uh, for its threading. So next slide, please. So you might be thinking like, okay, like sweet pattern, but what? <laughs> but why? And yeah, so a big motivation for me um, is the significance of the mitochondrial DNA. So during sexual reproduction and when the egg fertilize, 
um, it actually kills the mitochondria and the sperms. So all the mitochondrial DNA that you get are from your mother. So what that also means is that the mitochondrial DNA and the hyperferrite regions of it is used to trace your ancestry, particularly your maternal ancestry. So this is a map of that shows you the spread of different like haplogroups from this mitochondria. And next slide, please. That's mine, M8. So I'm Korean, and you can actually see how that M8 region does also spread towards Korea. Um, and yeah, so next slide, please. So just like after going through like the process of you know swabbing my cheeks. Oh no, uh, I select, uh, like okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, I guess like what I wanted to say is that like it's like something for my cheeks. It's so minuscule, it's invisible, but the kind of like scale of time and data that I can get out of this was like so awestruck for me. And in my case, it's like what do I do when I'm so awestruck? It's like you make art, and I felt like weaving and thinking about the fabric of life, like this felt like the right medium for it. So if any of this struck a chord with you, feel free to follow me. Uh, like email me or follow me on Instagram. Thank you. Hi, um, and my name is Tomo Mori. Hi, my faces. Um, I'm a visual artist, currently focusing on the uh, bio art and make ropes from um, donated fabric from families and friends. Um, I started making ropes from like 2016. Um, these are, this is a photo of an experiment that I was doing at the Wave Hill Winter Workspace Licensee, uh, just working around like like a rib, rib cage like uh, foam. Um, now my rope have a wire inside so I can shape it any form that I want to as long as the weight allow. Um, so just kind of experimenting what my visual language are, like what I want to tell. Uh, but at this time I was just really feeling a lot of mental health crisis and how do I protect our heart, our feelings. So, so those are the themes that I was working around. Um, next slide, please. So I'm a, I have a back, painting background. I only started doing the five art last five years. And um, so just kind of going back and forth, painting and the uh, five art, and that's speaking of the same things. Um, so this is uh, another kind of uh, protecting heart uh, theme painting. Okay, yeah, so that's that's the size of the fiber art, like it's sort of like a wall size. Okay, next, yeah. And this piece is the most recent uh, group exhibition at uh, Five Mile uh, by Asian Nish, curated by uh, Cecile Chong and Sophia Ma, a um, group of Asian artists. Um, this piece was about um, um, uh, tribute to uh, Asian American um, and Asian people who died by um, anti-Asian um, violence. Um, it took me two years to build this, but like, it, it gave me time to really think what I wanted to do with that kind of the, the tribute um, as an art uh, form. Um, and uh, I was happy to finally finish it and uh, send the message out. So that, that, that's good. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Ami. I was born in Seoul, Korea, and then I moved to New York City in 2011 to go to Persons, and I studied fashion design there. Um, as a former fashion designer and a current contemporary textile focused visual art, I'm very, very excited to be here, 
I, I never really um, get to introduce my fashion work ever since I started my um, visual art in more like contemporary context. Uh, I just want to pass this around. This is my fashion collection that I did in 2016. So these slides are about the fashion collection that I did in Parsons. Um, it's called Mold Collection. It, um, as it said, it's um, inspired by mold, specifically slime mold. I was very intrigued by the shapes and texture, colors of mold and how they grew, um, how they grow and you know, how they make their own community. So I also worked in Jane's space, as you did, um, to grow actual mold and how they really work, how they really look like. And I incorporated the texture and colors, like I did some bacterial painting, like you see in the middle, and I, um, uh, yeah, I was already textile driven um, designer back then, so I did a lot of um, fabrications, fabric manipulation, so all of the pieces of my collection was made by hand, I would say. Um, yeah, so we can go next. I, yeah, so this is starting, um, this is starting to show my contemporary art. Or, um, I started using my uh, fashion design patterns to incorporate my stitches. So I'm going to go fast. I have 10 seconds. So I'm currently doing textile work using yarn and rope, um, um, visualizing my spirituality and my interest in science. And I love to show more of my work. So please visit my website and Instagram. It's not showing here. So please talk to me. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, my name is Shannon Yu. I'm from Taiwan. I am a dancer choreographer and I am the 2023 J1 Fellowship for Dance and Choreography. And my current practice includes breaking, hip hop, contemporary dance, and Wing Chun martial arts. And today I want to share this piece that I am choreographing and I'm going to be showing actually as part of the fellowship. And this piece started from a vision that I have that is two dancers with strings connected their wrists. That's my end for this town hall. It's the test. And yeah, I'll just show that, Justin. Thank you. So I'm uh, going to be showing a 15 minutes work in progress in November, on November 6th with movement research and I'm going to be showing a full piece in next year in March. So if that interests you, if I interest you at all, come talk to me. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Lulu Long. I'm a visual artist from Taiwan. Um, I have a background in costume and fashion design, so in my early work I use fabric and clothing elements in my work. And this is a performative installation resulting in a nine foot tall soft structure uh, made with fabric and buttons. Next. And next. Uh, so inside each button, there's a passport photo I found online. So from afar, you see like, everything looks alike, and, but then when you look closer, and everything is like, each face is different. Next. And then I started to use white shirt, white dress shirt as a motif to talk to, to meditate on classism, um, similarity and differences, uh, and connect with non-people, and next. Um, we can see that, and next. 
And so people can wander around my work and then to discover the details and the uniqueness of each piece, even I they look alike from afar. Next, uh, this is another piece, uh, example of like, using the fabric in my work. Next, next. And later I started to make it, I make this installation, I turn white shirt as a container um, to pour resin in. Next. And so one side, the, the back side, you still see the fabric texture and the uh, wrinkles. Next. And the front side tends to be a flat, flat surface on which, on which I carve um, carve drawing of the feeling uh, toward the, the feeling about um, the conformity, uh, uh, the feeling about the yeah, conformity and also this uh, in, in between us as a person and also as an immigrant. Uh, next. Um, next. Uh, my recent work is an interactive in installation. Um, uh, so the circular, the circular objects are interconnected uh, in one pulley system. So when you, the visitor actually are invited to interact with the object, so they can move them. So when one is moved, and uh, more than one is moved, they actually affect the position of uh, the position of others as well. And if you can show that next, 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 uh, this is a video, and that's the last. Thank you. Okay. Um, so that brings us to the end of our two-minute pitches. Let's um, give everybody who's going on a round of So if you were so moved that you want to share your own work now, um, we invite you to sign up for a 30-second pitch. Uh, you can just click on that QR code and enter your information. Um, but I also encourage you just to come down here and line up if you would like to give a 30 second pitch to talk about your work. Anybody, anybody? Come on down. Yeah. Yeah, we'll just do that. So I will um, hold up the magic iPad counter downer and give you 30 seconds. So just introduce yourself and Hi everyone, um, my name is Caroline Lim. I'm the Marketing and Communications Manager at the Asian Cultural Council, um, or ACC. Um, hello. And ACC uh, promotes and fosters cultural exchange between the US and Asia, primarily through giving direct grants to artists, scholars, arts professionals looking to travel between the US and Asia. We have an upcoming grant cycle that is for this fall, for 2024, projects and travel, uh, so I highly recommend if you're interested you check it out or talk to me. Uh, guidelines will be live on our website October 1st or the first week of October, and we will be accepting applications throughout the entire month of November. Uh, these are not grants that are solely limited to folks of Asian descent. Um, we are open to folks uh, citizenship from the US and 26 countries and regions in Asia, so please come talk to me. Hi, I'm Shazad. I'm forward to be here. Um, I make Zorsai. It's like if a mogul emperor invited you to the house music party. Uh, my partner and girlfriend say this, and I date night helping with this pitch. She's wearing my Belochi fabric and Chemawar fabric uh, bummer samples. You can pass that around, one of those you can see. Um, and I'll pass around this hat. This is a heck of a sample, it's unlabeled. Um, yeah, Zorsai, Z O R S A Y, means louder in Hindi and Urdu. It's a rally call. For what I'm doing, I produce these pieces in Karachi. I'm heading there on Sunday to sell, uh, to produce my fall collection, which is called Beauty and the Beast. Thank you. to each other, so come on down and have a drink and, and stick around for a while.